it's happening in New York, New Jersey, or Long Island. Hear about it with Joe Piscopo. Mornings, 6 to 10 on AM 970. The answer. Piscopo in the morning, 729 right now. Uh, Jacob Hubert is a uh, director of litigation uh, for the Liberty Justice Center, one of the lawyers who argued before the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday in the Janus case on behalf of Janus. And uh, Mr. Hubert, welcome to the program, sir. Thanks for having me. No, it's great. You were like before the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday? That's right, yesterday morning. And now you're on Piscopo in the morning. It's it's kind of a, it's kind of, you, you've fallen down a little bit, but listen, we appreciate that very much, sir. I think this is great. And you're on Fox News this morning as well? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah things are going well. You, you know, Mr. Hubert, where are you from, if I may ask? And I, I apologize, I should know this. I'm from Chicago. Wow. And so you got, you're the Illinois, and you're representing Janice, so we went to you, and now you, here you are, from uh, uh, Chicago, Illinois, and you're arguing in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and whether you agree with you, you know, your case or not, that's pretty monumental. I'm a son of a lawyer. I think that you should be congratulated for that, sir. Well, thank you. How did it work out, do you think, in, in, in your mind? I think it went well. You know, we made our case. Uh, some justices clearly seemed to get it, and, uh, and, and, seem inclined to protect my client's First Amendment rights. Others maybe not so much, but uh, we're optimistic. Yeah, so, so could you explain what this Janus case is all about? So this case is about whether the government can force people to give money to a union uh, just to have a government job. In 22 states, including Illinois and New York and others, mm -hmm. uh, the government forces many of its workers some 5 million people across the country, to give part of every paycheck to a union, whether they want to or not. And my client and many other people object to that and say it violates their First Amendment rights. Now, should they, and walk me through this, and forgive my ignorance on this, so if your client doesn't want to pay the dues, does he expect the union to negotiate, or is he completely on his own? Well, the law in these states says that the union has to represent everybody, whether they're union members or not. But the unions lobbied to have those provisions put in the law because they want to represent everybody. And they complain that, oh, if he wins, we'll have to represent him even though he's not paying. But my guess is they'll want to stay in that position of representing everybody, even if we do win, even if he doesn't have to pay, because that's a pretty uh, unique power that the unions have to speak on behalf of all workers. Yeah, and I, I said on the air uh uh, Mr. Hubert, I'm a union guy, and the union has protected me, you know, but we understand if you, you should have a choice in this day and age if you want to join the union or not, but if you don't join the union, then I think it would be, I think it would be fair to say the union should not cover you. But, uh, and yesterday we spoke with Randy Weingarten from the American Federation of Teachers, and she said that under the current law, no one is required to contribute to union political activity, and that is true, correct? Not really. It's true that you don't have to give toward unions like contributions to candidates and things related to elections. But the problem when you're talking about unions and government is everything they do is political. Even when they bargain on workers' behalf, they're telling the government things like uh, how much it should spend on workers' salaries and what kind of benefits it should provide and how it should run its programs. And all of those things are political policy issues. Uh, if anybody else talks to the government about those kinds of things, everybody recognizes that as political speech. And when anybody else does it, we call it lobbying. So when a worker is forced to give money to a public sector union, they're being forced to pay for somebody else's lobbying. Well, if you win, if uh, your client, Mr. Janice, wins, what are the practical implications of this case? Well, it means that every government worker in the country will be free to choose whether they're going to give any of their money to a union. And it means that unions will have to find ways to appeal to workers to get them to give the money voluntarily instead of just taking the money for granted. And that could make unions more responsive to their workers and better. Yeah. Now, you know, you heard this, that many on the left are portraying this as an attempt by the right-wing donors to hobble organized labor. Is, is that what you're feeling, sir? Uh, well, that's what they say, but of course it's not true. This is just about every individual's right to choose uh, whether they're going to fund a highly political group like a union. Everybody else in politics and society 
has to do their advocacy with money that people give them voluntarily. But unions have had this unique privilege where they can just take money from people for their advocacy, even if those people strongly disagree with many of the things the union advocates, as my client does. So now, and if you again, if you win, you're not going to take the pension and welfare from the unions. You'll take all the benefits of the unions, and you'll just the Janus, Mr. Janus, will do away with all of that, uh, Jacob. Everything will stay the same with respect to the unions and government workers, except that nobody will be forced to give money to the union anymore. That's the only thing that will change as a result of our case. Yeah, but but you understand that it's, it's it would seem a little disingenuous, and I say respectfully to you, sir, that if you're not going to pay, then you shouldn't get any of the benefits. You understand that, correct? If they want to change the law to say that the union only represents the people who are dues-paying members, yeah. that would be a perfectly reasonable solution. But as I say, I think the unions will actually want the situation where they're representing the people who aren't paying. Yeah. I think the unions actually prefer that situation to a situation where they're not representing everybody. Uh, Jacob, great conversation. Uh, where would you go to law school, if I can ask? University of Chicago. God bless you, man. You do. You know what? Whether you, people agree with you or not, you're doing a, a great job. You should be proud of yourself. Again, I speak to you as a son of a lawyer, and that that's a that's a pretty big thing. Did you get nervous before you went before the Supreme Court? No, you know it's uh, it's it's certainly a unique experience. Yeah, but yeah. you know the arguments are pretty straightforward, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. we're pretty confident in them. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Please come back and keep us posted on this case, if you would, Mr. Hubert. Okay, will do. And thank you for joining us this morning, sir. Uh, 735, Jacob Hubert is Director of Litigation for the Liberty Justice Center, one of the lawyers who argued before the U.S. Supreme Court uh, for uh, this guy, Janice. And it's very, very interesting. I understand, you kind of understand both sides, but my, my main thing is, well, okay, you should have a right not to join the union. You should have a right not to pay. But don't expect any benefits. Don't expect pension and welfare. Don't expect any minimum wage. Don't expect any holidays. Don't expect all the benefits that the unions give you. Eight seven. Everybody knows this guy. No, everybody knows he can do a radio show. Joe Piscopo. Mornings, 6 to 10 on AM 970. The Answer.